Hey guys, welcome to Thrive Bites Podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Colin Zhu, and thank you so much for listening on. You could have been anywhere in the world and you decided to spend just a few moments of your precious time and we greatly appreciate it. Here on the podcast, we talk about three things, living a plant-powered lifestyle and enhancing emotional resilience and creating a thriving mindset. And I interview a range of passionate guests such as physicians, dietitians, coaches, entrepreneurs, and many more. And please join me as I deliver these engaging, informative, and high-valued conversations for you. And just remember, the first five seasons of the Thrive Bites podcast can now be found in the new The Chef Doc app, available in your Apple Store and Google Play stores. So what are you waiting for? Come on inside. Hey guys, what's going on? Thank you for hopping on to another episode of Thrive Bites Podcast. I'm Dr. Colin Zhu, and uh, today I have my lovely, lovely friend and colleague, Dr. Jessica Matthews. Um, she is the author of Stretching to Stay Young. A little bit about her, she's a yoga, certified yoga um, instructor. She's also a assistant professor, director, and creator and of the Master of Kinesiology and Integrative Wellness Program at Point Loma Nazarene University. And she's an award-winning and innovative uh, educator, amongst other things. And in this episode, we talk about what is the root and the Venn diagram and the interplay behind behavior change. All the different things of how come I can't achieve this, how come I can't do this, um, and be able to dive deep into you know those nuances, uh, the signs behind it. Uh, we talk a lot about coaching, what that means, right? And then we also have a short uh, fitness demo where she's going to be demonstrating um, and showcasing for us um, the different stretching uh, techniques that she has in her books. So you don't want to miss this and I'll see you guys on the inside. Okay, guys. Well, welcome to another episode of Thrive Bites Podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Colin Zhu, and thank you so much for being here with us. You could have been anywhere in the world, and you decided to share your precious moments with us, and I am so appreciative of that. So for today, I have a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful friend and colleague. Um, her name is Dr. Jessica Matthews, Okay. We can spend a whole episode just listing out <laughs> her entire bio, but she is um, a assistant pro uh, professor, director, and creator of the Master of Kinesiology and Integrative Wellness Program at Point Loma Nazarene University. She's an award-winning and innovative educator, and she has developed and impl implemented graduate degree and professional certificate programs at several colleges in Southern California. And she's a masterful uh, teacher of areas such as integrative health and mind-body medicine. And she's also a national board certified health and wellness coach and a doctorate in behavioral health with an emphasis in clinical integrative care from Arizona State uh, University. And she's also um, the author of her book that she's going to go into. We're going to save it to her at the end because we have wonderful, wonderful demo to showcase. But overall, she is a lovely, soul-centered person, and I cannot wait to have her on the show. Please welcome Dr. Jessica Matthews. Hello. Hello. Oh, my goodness. Thank you so much, Colin, for having me here. I'm so excited. I'm even more excited. So we're going to have such a colorful conversation, uh, even with... This is what I love about crossing with different uh, souls in life is that you just know just through chemistry that, you know, you're going to have such a wonderful conversation, even right off the bat before meeting them, you know, just, just feeling that vibe and you definitely, you know, emanate that. So I love it for all the work you do. So for those that don't know who you are, can you, you know, just showcase for us, you know, your point A to point B, your super heroin origin story, if you will, because we're just so fascinated with superheroes now these days, because you play so many hats, you have so many different letters and degrees of the alphabet behind your name. But what was it, what sparked for you to kind of start this transition of this curiosity, this learning, this absorbing of knowledge and application of just health and wellness, you know, into your life? It's a beautiful question to start with. And it's one I so appreciate when people ask, because what I'll open with is basically saying, my journey is not linear in any way. And I always find that that's where the real kind of magic happens in things I never even knew were possible. 
in my professional life, uh, how they translate into my personal life, how I thrive in my life, how I empower others to thrive. And so I give the nutshell version because as you mentioned, there's so many things I could share, but where all those letters, the degrees, the credentials, which are all important and valid. And as a professor, I appreciate, you know, the curiosity that comes with learning, lifelong learning. But what was the impetus to your question that got me on this journey that has obviously evolved and morphed just like all good stories do? What it really started with is not a bright spot, as many people might think. Um, my family really was the for me for getting into wanting to better understand how to improve health and well-being because my family what I grew up witnessing firsthand in my immediate family with people like my mom, with people like my grandmother, my aunts and uncles were chronic diseases and the ramifications of those chronic diseases when not effectively treated. And so things like type two diabetes, obesity, heart disease, these are all commonplace. I've been witness to them since I was a small child. What comes along with those again, without effective treatment, is ultimately things like renal failure, blindness, amputations, uh, you know, living no longer than maybe 55 years or 60 if you're lucky, and the quality of life of those latter years is quite poor. And this was to me, I just this was my family. I thought this was, you know, genetic predisposition. This is what my fate is. But I got curious to your you know, word you use. I got curious to say, could there be a better way? Could there be a way I could prevent? walking that same path that I'm witnessing in my own family? And also, could I help other people either prevent those diseases or utilize mechanisms to effectively treat them? Because it wasn't that my family wasn't receiving health care. It wasn't changing the course or trajectory of their health and well-being. In fact, it just continued to decline. And so where my interest started, and it kind of started without me actually realizing it was going to kick off a really interesting journey, I started really with an interest in exercise. I mm. wanted to understand is exercise something, because I didn't grow up in a household again where exercise was like we were regularly physically active. I played some sports and was involved, you know, active with my friends, but my family, my parents weren't modeling, you know, daily exercise and that just, it wasn't my upbringing. And that was very different when I then went a path and became a group fitness instructor. That was my start. I'm going to tell you, Colin, I was teaching things like step aerobics and I had cassette tapes. And oh, I was did Iron you wear Man. the leg warmers? Did you wear the leg warmers? I might have wore the leg. Now, the good news <laughs> is I missed the era of the like the thong leotards, but I was definitely right at the tail end of all that good stuff. But what I found through the experience was I loved moving myself. I was like, wow, movement is so exciting. And what was so empowering was not only that my body could move into all these amazing things, but I was empowering other people to move and to find joy in moving. That's what group fitness, really skillful group fitness instruction mm -hmm. can do. And so it set me on a trajectory to say, hold on. And I'm a first generation college student. I'll mention that because I didn't know what that future would hold. I thought I wanted to go to college, but once I started teaching group fitness, I realized I want to go to college. And I want to learn how to teach and I want to learn more about exercise. So I combined the two and I said, this is the area I really want to do a deep dive. I want to know, can exercise transform people's health and well-being? You know, the answer, Colin, I don't have to tell you. The answer is yes, like an overwhelming yes. And then that led along the way to wanting to know, could things like nutrition, you know, I myself personally started applying. I think when you start by applying it in your own life. I call it with my students practicing what we preach. Lo and behold, then it invites you to be curious and to explore the scientific research, <laughs> to get into all the nitty gritty details. But I had started you know, following a vegetarian diet, very plant centric, very early on in my life, because actually my sister did the very same thing. And for me, I started going, okay, there's something to this nutrition thing. Flash forward, I work deeply as an exercise physiologist. I knew I wanted to one day be a college professor maybe teaching exercise science, future exercise professionals, so they could have that ripple impact. But along the way, here's the fork in the road. Along the way, I started to realize a lot of people know exercise and eating healthful is good for them. But guess what, Colin? You're going to know the answer to this one, too. Most people don't do these things. And I said, why? Why is that? 
I'm telling them everything I know. I mean, I've got now at this point two degrees. I've got every credential you can think of. And I'm telling people info. And they're not doing those things. They might do it for a moment, but then it you know, kind of falls by the wayside. And I realized I didn't know anything about, I joke, what happens above the neck? What happens up here? And I was like, oh my gosh, I need to understand human behavior. I took like one health psychology class in my graduate program, but I was like, gosh, I know so much about the physical body, but how is all this connected? And a lot of this stemmed from me becoming a yoga teacher. So I was very, you know, done that for almost two decades been teaching some form of movement to groups for over two decades, yoga being a large part of my, you know, my work and my passion. And also there was other events in my life, particularly the passing of my sister and my father that really led me to want to deeper understand the behavioral aspect. So I said, what does any good, good teacher is a good student and a good lifelong curious learner dove head first. I wanted to know everything about human behavior. That's what led to my doctoral training, as you mentioned, in behavioral health. People thought I was nuts. Like they're like, you should have a PhD in exercise physiology. At this point, I'm an exercise science professor, but I'm integrating all of these things from integrative health because I had training and background in that area. I was kind of pushing the envelope of things that weren't commonplace in an exercise science department at the time, but it was what I knew was needed. And then I went out and sought out what did I not know? And I wanted to know more about what happened in healthcare because I hadn't worked as a clinician at that time. And so I wanted to know, if you wanna change something, go learn what's on the other side of the fence. Mm -hmm. And so that led me to become a health and wellness coach, serve my doctoral degree, to have clinical rotation at UC San Diego, where I still have a clinical and research appointment, and just learn so much about how and why people change. Not just information, but how to actually empower people to live their best life. I think it fits exactly what you're up to. I know you know what you're up to with this show and with all the work you do too. Before we get into the nitty gritty of the how and why, because it's kind of like, you know, when I think of the how and why, and I think of behavior change, it's kind of like, you know, that beautiful, you know, banyan tree, you know, it's just beautiful, like, you know, just strong roots and trunk. And you just have this, you know, just beautiful branches that are coming out, going all which in every direction. And that kind of, you know, it's a good analogy of how chronic diseases just kind of manifest. And this whole centerpiece is trunk, this beautiful trunk and root in the ground is a lot of it is behavior change, right? And so before we get into the nitty gritty of it, you know, I want to know just offhand after you've added this part, what shifted? You know, what did you see the changes in your, you know, your clients, you know, the, the people, the, you know, your audience members that you're, you know, students that you're like, what, what, what changed for you? And then I also want to ask, you know, you had family members, you know, that, you know, maybe, you know, not so much, you know, did that change for your family members as well when you started adding this, uh, adding this into your repertoire? This question lights me up. Okay, can you tell I'm light? I like I have a nice bright shirt on and I get lit up really easily. And so it's good. It's just you said we're gonna have a you're lighting up the room. You're lighting up the room. You're lighting up the room. I love it. Just perfect. But what changed? And this is not an overstatement. Everything, Colin. Like everything. And I tell this to my students because ironically, right now, one of the classes I'm teaching in our, we have a master's of science in integrative wellness program. That's the program that brought me to Point Loma Nazarene University. I had the pleasure to create it and to say, what is the missing education that health professionals need? Because my students are representative of the true interdisciplinary, interprofessional care team. This is like so amazing to see it now. We're going into our seventh cohort of the program. But what changed? everything. Because what changed ultimately was I realized that the times, and I'm just going to say this lovingly, and any, you know, fellow clinicians, health professionals out there that are listening, or maybe just individuals, and you think in your own life, the approaches, at least I'm going to take ownership, the approaches I was taught, kind of wore my expert hat, you mentioned I have all these letters after my name, I just thought people needed more and more information. But once I recognized that people are whole, People are resourceful and people are capable of change, even if they've tried. And, you know, it's like shoots and ladders. If you remember that fun game from you know, back in the day, you can go up a couple levels and then you sometimes you take the slide back down. It's the little one or it's the big one or the big ladder. And that's how life works. 
But what I found is when I met people and now I was equipped with an understanding of how people change the science and then the art, which is how you actually, I say meet people, not just for the first time, meet them. Every interaction you have, it is transformative. And my students, the class I'm teaching right now is integrative health and wellness coaching. And I said this week one, I think my students, you know, lovingly, they sometimes say, Dr. Matthews, you know, you're, you're out there. And now we're at, at week seven and they're like, oh my goodness, these, this coaching thing. Cause you get it. Cause you're a coach. You go. They're like this. I mean, all of a sudden, next thing I know, I'm using these skills when I talk to my mother, my brother, my fiance, my whoever. And I'm like, and what's happening? And what happens to answer the question you asked is it changes things. It changed the way I approach my work. I found more joy in my work because people were actually doing the things they said they wanted to do. Mm-hmm. Not what I was telling them to do. Colin, what they want to do. People want to make changes in their life. People want to thrive. They want to live healthy and full and joyous. And my role, once I understood it, was I could support and empower them to do the things they wanted to do. And that would address many things. It would help prevent those chronic diseases. It would help to treat and even reverse or put into remission those chronic diseases. You asked about what impact in my family. Sadly, for some of my family members, they're no longer here. One woman who gets a shout out every time I have any form, she knows she's my case study. She was a big part of why I do the work I do. And lovingly, the great news, she's still here, is my mom. My mom, if you would have looked at her chart, you would see her medical history. You say, there's no way. There's no way that she should still be here. But yet she is. And you know what? Things have changed for her. When she was told, you'll just have diabetes forever, you'll take insulin, you know, you've been on various Medicaid, that's just how it will go. For her personally, when she implemented lifestyle changes, she no longer takes insulin. She has A1Cs that have been in a not a range that she had never seen, and doctors said, you likely will never see that. Mm-hmm. And lo and behold, the things that she's done in her life, exercise, healthful nutrition, positive social connection, can't stress. I mean, the pillars we know of lifestyle medicine, managing stress, changing the way you think about yourself and your life and what's possible. These things are actual medicine. And that's not any knock. I have to say this in an integrative approach, as you know, but just so all of us together listening in this conversation, being a part of it, Integrative approaches don't say it's one or the other. It's conventional medicine or it's alternative practice. Integrative says we look at everything in totality. We look to the evidence. We look to all therapeutic modalities that, again, have good evidence to them. And we utilize them as appropriate for the unique individual in front of us. And so your answer to the question, everything changed. It changed the trajectory of my professional life. It's why I smile like this and I'm like this. I lecture until the late evening and I'm still like this. 6.30 in the morning, like this. Do any of your facial muscles hurt? I feel like I, maybe it's helping keep me like, maybe they're working so much they're going to keep me looking young for, I don't know. I mean, you're throwing ideas out, Colin. But I just been putting this out there to say, when people are with me, this is how I am because I see the potential in people. Mm-hmm. And I will share, I think oftentimes our mindset about how we meet, if we are working with, say, patients or clients or students or individuals in our family, just everyday interactions. If we see people as being broken, in need of fixing, right, that they're not capable, nah, they're, they're, they're not motivated. I hear this all the time. Well, someone's not motivated. They're not ready to change. There's some truth to that last part, but not a lot. If we change our approach, and that's what I challenge my students who are practicing professionals, most of them, to understand and be open, curious about a new way in which to approach your work. And you'll find a lot of joy in it. If you had to distill this into like a one liner and, you know, not to kind of knock on any of the behavioral, you know, psychology that that you've accumulated, would you say that does it come down to like their belief system, like actually believing that they can actually change. So it's not necessarily having all the tools and strategies laid out on the table, right? They have all the resources, but it's the inherent belief that, you know, they can't do it or they can do it is really kind of like the catalyst to be able to really moving forward as opposed to moving backwards. A hundred percent. And I can say it. I'm a New Yorker by background. If anyone hasn't picked that up yet, I can talk a lot. But you said one sentence. You just said it. 
it boils down to self-efficacy. I'm going to use the behavioral science term, but it's the underpinnings of every model and theory, literally, of health behavior change. It's self-efficacy. It's a person's belief, like you said, in their own capabilities. They then will along the way. That's the foundation. Then the tools, you know, kind of the action steps, the things that systematically build, those will come. But it's cultivating that self-efficacy, increasing it. I believe I can do this. That's at the heart of great coaching. It's at the heart of behavioral change. And so, yes, and it's the heart of, like I said, the models, the theories, the geeky stuff. But that's what it is. And it's called self-efficacy. But that belief is powerful and should not be kind of just stated lightly. So I appreciate that you, you shared it. Because that mm. is the heart of it. And it's really powerful. Awesome. So let's make some definitions and kind of step a little bit backwards. So what is a coach at the end of the day? And how does that compare to, you know, someone that works in therapy, someone that's a clinician or a doctor? Like, how does that, can you, can you state for us, you know, what, is, what are the main differences? Absolutely. And I love, if I may, I like to flip by starting, what are some of the commonalities? Because I always think of this in the same way we talk about nutrition, right? And different, you know, approaches to, you know, dietary habits, eating patterns, quote unquote diets, uh, is what's similar versus what's different. And so across all of these different areas, these health professions, we, I hope, are all focused on the individual we're serving, that patient or that client. So it is client-centered. In coaching, now I'll start to make some delineations. In coaching, there is an aspect that really the client is the lead. And that might sound like semantics or that might sound totally out there. But the reality is that people have basic psychological needs, one of which is people crave autonomy. People want to feel in control in their lives. And so, you know, obviously, Colin, as a physician, when people are navigating health challenges, it feels very out of control. And so when it comes to things like complex behaviors, behavior change in exercise, nutrition, et cetera, people want to feel some sense of being in control. And so our approach in coaching, how I would describe a coach to answer that part of the question is truly a partner in the journey. And I'm using those two words, partner and journey, very intentionally to partner with someone and to say in my analogy, kind of metaphor I'll give, if we were in a car the person I'm working with, whether as a client or patient, depends on the context I'm serving them. But that individual is in the driver's seat. And I, as a coach, am in the passenger seat. Clarification. I'm not posted up just relaxing, taking a nap in the back seat. Because people hear like client-led or patient-driven and think that means I'm just sitting back, hands up, and letting them potentially careen off the road. That is not at all what coaching is. Mm -hmm. But coaching says, you know what? I, as a coach, have expertise, but you know who else does? The person who lives with themselves 24 hours a day, seven days a week, the patient or the client, they know a lot about themselves. So when we partner together and we both bring our expertise and they're both weighted and valued equally, this is the shift. And I take, again, use myself as an example. I'll invite everyone to self-reflect who are clinicians and other health professionals. I oftentimes, as an exercise physiologist, would arrive like, I'm the expert. I have the degrees. I went to school. I got the certs. But when you meet people and partner with them and say, I have expertise, you have expertise, oh my goodness, what would happen if we worked together in the direction you want to go? They're the driver of the car, but we need, Colin, when we're going on a good adventure, we need to punch something into the GPS, because if not, we'll kind of be just swirling around. We could end up who knows where, maybe a fun side trip, but it could also take us very far from, I use my kind of hand in the air symbol, our true north. Where is it that we want to go? What's that vision for our best possible life that we have? This is where an input from the individual is necessary. What is their vision and what do they value? Because what ultimately they will be faced with life is life is life. It's full of a lot of intricacies and complexities, and they will have competing priorities, right? This is why people say, I wanted to go work out today, uh, but insert why it didn't happen. As part of coaching and being a partner, we're ultimately there to serve an individual in setting the direction that they'll lead, that they want to go, and then helping them reverse engineer action steps that will help them move in that direction. It's a journey. It's an ongoing forever journey. It's so exciting. 
And along the way, we want to know what do they value and prioritize? Because as we learn their values and this vision they have for themselves and the belief we help empower and lift out of them in their capabilities, this is what will be fuel for the journey. And they will need that fuel because there will be bumps and dips and, you know, things, the weather will change, the stuff you can't control in life. But if we are in tune with a person's values and we meet them with unconditional positive regard to go psychology for a minute, positive psych. I mean, we meet people seeing that they are capable of doing the things they want to do, Colin, even if they have not had, quote, success before. What we do is what have we learned along the way? How do we take the learnings and translate them into forward action? This is what makes coaching distinct from some of the other professions you mentioned, though there's some overlap too. And I always say a great clinician of any kind can and lovingly should take a coach approach. And I use quotes because just one way to say there are aspects of coaching that can be applied to all health professionals. And I believe it will change the way in which you serve the clients or the patients that you serve. For sure. I love the car analogy where, you know, the client is in the driver's seat and you're, you know, in the passenger seat. And it's such a shift. You know, we did get taught as physicians in terms of the doctor and patient relationship. And it's always been classically and historically, you know, I'm up here and you're down here. It's a one way street. I give orders. I tell it like it is. And so much have I heard through, you know, the years that I've been, you know, serving uh, my patients that. Doctors, you know, aren't hearing me. I'm not being listened to. There wasn't enough time. And I feel like I'm not really getting anywhere. And it's not necessarily the, the provider slash physician slash healthcare professional's fault. A part of it is just not receiving that kind of education. I mean, you yourself had to seek out so much, you know, you know, for yourself, because you felt like something was missing. You see this great, beautiful puzzle picture, but you realize that certain pieces were missing. And so you had to actually find those pieces and actually put them in yourself. But imagine if we actually had that same foundational training across all boards and all specialties, that would be, you know, game changing, right? And I do agree with you. I think the coach approach is one of the best ways to be able to implement, you know, changes that is effective in so many aspects of health and wellness. So the how and why, one of the thoughts that came to me as you were talking is, why is it that patients who are not, you know, when we're talking about self-efficacy and not prioritizing, you know, their goals, how is it for them getting to the root of it that they are allowing these outside external forces being able to kind of take over or kind of overwhelm their self priorities and let those forces drive, you know, the car or drive the boat, you know, how, how, because I've encountered so many people that have let these outside forces kind of you know, drive it for them, you know, is it because of society, their upbringing, you know, maybe different forms of trauma, like, what is it that, you know, they deprioritize themselves? You've touched on many of them. And it's why we take to use some terminology, uh, that social ecological model or socio ecological framework, you often hear it referred to, is that there are all of those things. And it starts from kind of this inner circle, and then you have these kind of concentric circles that go outward. The inner ones start with ourselves. It's intrapersonal. It's what we believe. Part of what you shared, those can be things like, you know, what beliefs we, you know, were formed from our upbringing, what beliefs we hold today. So we might, you know, the way we think, as we may talk about more, does basics of behavioral science says the way we think actually impacts the way we feel and in turn the way we act. And so to that part, the act part is, do we take those action steps in the direction of our well-being in the area or areas we say we want to? Because it's not someone else telling. These are the patients are saying, this is what I want to do. And that's, again, the shift in coaching, which is so powerful. So our work is part of how do we support you in being accountable to you, not accountable to me. Like you're not getting a graded homework assignment. 
but you say you want to do these things. So yes, it starts in that inner circle. We could extrapolate out because there's a lot of layers. You highlighted a few. Then there's the interpersonal. So those are our relationships, the people we surround ourselves with. Those have impacts. Our communities that we live in or have grown up in, public policy. I mean, it, that's how big it keeps getting. All those things play a role. And so that's why when I hear lovingly, I'll hear things like, I have a non-compliant patient. I have a difficult patient. I have an unmotivated patient. I personally don't subscribe to any of that. What I believe is it's an opportunity for me in the work that I do to dig in deeper and to get to understand why is it, right? When faced with this is happening in life and this is what I want to do. And the scales are doing this. We talk about it all the time in behavioral change. It's that decisional balance. And it's happening like in real time in people's minds is goodness. I have a priority, you know, deadline at work and I want to, you know, exercise. And then it's like I, you know, when I exercise, I feel better. And, you know, oh, gosh, I just don't have time. My boss needs me to do this. Gosh, family commitments. And you hear what we talk from motivational interviewing about things like sustain talk, all the reasons you can't. And then you hear the glimmers of change talk, all the reasons why you want to. It's the reasons, the abilities, the desires, those kinds of things. As coaches, we keep a keen ear. Right. And what we work to do is elicit more change talk. So the scales, Colin, tip, where it goes from the, oh, there's so many reasons I can't, to starting to highlight what are the reasons why you want to, you need to, you're able to, you're going to. That's what we work to do because people will say, my, my students love this. They'll go, now that they have this framework and this insight, they're uh -huh. like, Dr. Matthews, people are saying oppositional things. I want to go work out. And when I do, I feel better. And I can't go because X, Y, Z, A, you know, the whole list. And so what we work to do is not necessarily try to unpack all the like why you can't. It's really getting to the heart of, but why do you want to? You just said when you exercise, you feel better. So I start always with the sustain talk. In this case, I'd say, you know, wow, you're recognizing, you know, your busy work schedule and your family commitments. It makes it hard to find the time to exercise. And when you exercise, you feel better. You show up as your best self. And then you know what I do, Colin? I pause. That's a double-sided reflection to give a little MI shout out. And you pause on the change talk. Because guess what happens next? More change talk. Yeah, you know what? Jessica, when I do those things, yeah, I do feel better. I show up for my family better. Gosh, you know, I really got to get my head. Okay, I got to think, how do I make this something I do? I'm not saying it's magic and every time it's a snap. Because behavior, if it was that easy, I'd be out of a job. Right. <laughs> behavior change is complex. But when you listen for the change talk, when you hear those reasons, you've got to dig into those and keep elevating them to the place where a person says, you know what? Those things are important. I have work. I have respond. I got bills to pay, but I won't be able to work and pay those bills if I don't take care of myself. I might have more bills as a result. And so that's part of getting, again, people's values and helping them continue to hear themselves say why they want to change. I hope that makes sense. But that's, I mean, this is some of the secret sauce of how you help people prioritize the things they say they want to prioritize amidst life. And that's why I say life's going to keep happening. But guess what? You can keep prioritizing the things you value and you prioritize and fit them in the complexities of life because they'll always be there. Yeah, exactly. We could go forever, you know, with this. And it's very, very important to be able to constantly remind everyone a lot of what you said is a lot of refocusing and reframing and being able to kind of put energy towards why someone wants a certain, you know, change or a goal and be able to kind of continue to draw, you know, energy towards it. And when I was talking about all these outside forces, it's almost like, like you said, it's a balance beam. I, I use analogies of a seesaw, you know, for my clients and it's very important. And what's also in addition uh, for coaching is that we show up a lot more you know, then for example, just an annual wellness check as a physician, right? We were just in their face, you know, maybe every two weeks, every three weeks, every three months, you know, there's, it's just a constant reminder and that repetition, right? That famous phrase of repetition is the, you know, master of, you know, you know, everything 
it, we just show up in people's faces. So it's that constant reminder of why we need to go towards a certain target for ourselves. Mm-hmm. And I think that's one of the added benefits of um, coaching. It's so true. And it's really, you know, I do, I do a lot of, I talk with my hands. Cause again, I disclose I'm from New York and I always do this kind of symbol. My students know it well. I call it the true North. You can, you know, any phraseology you like in coaching, we all have our own styles. We always say, and it's in every profession, but to me, it's the true North. And what we have the privilege, cause I believe that what we have the privilege of doing not to people with people is journeying with them in the direction always of their true North. And just like I gave the shoots and ladders analogy, because one, I love that game, but two, it's very <laughs> fitting for behavioral change and life as a whole, is you're going to have movements in all directions. Nothing is linear. I think I said that earlier. Yeah. Nothing's linear when you have a great career that you really love and you do the work you're meant to do, you're called to do. And also nothing is linear in terms of life and behavioral change is a perfect example. But as a coach, since we're partnered, and like you said, we have more frequent interactions that's powerful because one, people aren't alone. They have a partner. I'm that vested in their true north in the same way they are. But I'm yeah. with them because they've set where they want to go. My work, and again, I have to just clarify, people all the time think coaching is passive. Like that we just let clients do whatever, make up whatever, and we're just like along, we'll see how it goes. And it's like, that's not a, that's not at all how it works. But what we do is we elicit from people And what we help them do not only is what's the direction they want to go, since we have the frequent touch points, guess what happens? Bump in the road, a little detour, something didn't go according to plan. We call them experiments. We tried something out. It didn't work. Life's happening, right? Maybe it's a really busy season of life at work, at home, in your community, however you're involved. Great. That's life. It's always going to work like that. Along the way, what we do is says when those things happen, not if. When those things happen, how do we keep moving in the direction of the true north? And that'll be some creative problem solving together. And that's what sets people up. It's like the analogy, right? You can teach a person, you can give them a fish or you can teach them to fish. Coaching, we teach you to fish or whatever, you know, you prefer to eat. But just saying, it's equipping people with the wherewithal, the awareness, and then the ability, the self-efficacy, the belief that even when the road I'm traveling on gets bumpy, it gets really rocky. I can still navigate through it. I might have to adjust my plans, right? It might look a little different. If exercise is my goal, maybe this week it's a little different, but I'm still getting movement in. I'm still working in the direction of my true north. But in this moment, I might have to recalibrate. That's great. This is what we should all have in all facets of our life. But that's the privilege we have in coaching is helping people understand when those things occur, not if, how will we continue to navigate in the direction that we set our GPS to? Yeah. Yeah. I love it. So I, I, I look at things in terms of a process and, and, and practice and, you know, it's not always about the end destination. And even if you meet those goals, right, it's important to continue to shoot for new goals, Mm -hmm. right. And to shoot for new targets for yourself. And at the end of the day, just enjoy it. It's just a beautiful gift that we're, you know, given in terms of life and navigating, you know, even through its bumps is just as rewarding, right? I tell people, to me, there's no such thing as mistakes and failures if there's no lesson to be learned. Um, and they're just mile markers for you to continue to progress on your journey. So Dr. Jessica, we can, um, you know, talk all day long. I do super, super excited about this, want to transition into um, a demo. But before we do that, um, one of my favorite, you know, uh, questions to ask is, this podcast is all about thriving. And for you, you're just above light. And I'm curious, if you can share with the audience, what lights up your fire, we are we already know the community you serve lights up your fire. But what continues to solidify that foundation to keep you grounded? So humbled from my point of view, um, but still gets you to really, really just do this effortless, you know, work that you do. It starts really to me the first thing that comes to mind, because I do believe this might sound bold. But I believe if you were to, you know, really say, why are we all here? What is it we're here to do? I believe it starts with genuine, loving service to others. We are part of something much greater than just ourselves. And so one of the things that lights me up and brings me immense joy and enables me to thrive, how exciting, 
I thrive when other people thrive. So service to others is one of the, I mean, that's the bedrock for me. And I think of it in every facet of my work, every circle I get to be in, every hat, as you said earlier, that I have the privilege and you know pleasure to wear. It's how am I of service to others? And in doing that, they thrive and I thrive. So that to me is like the number one thing is when I serve others and empower them to live their best lives, in turn, I'm living my best life. And like, how amazing is that? Right? I mean, Kyle, you know, because this is what you're, we're cut from the same globe on this one. Like when you serve others and empower them to live well, well, to thrive, you will thrive too. So that would be one thing I would say. Another thing that comes to mind for me is really, and I talk about this, I had the opportunity to do a TEDx talk in 2019 and I titled it Reclaiming Wellness. And you'll like this, Colin, because wellness sometimes gets a bad rap because there's some interesting things out there, I'm going to call it. But there's some great evidence, too. And so I said, no, I'm not going to shy away from wellness, like the word, because the the concept is correct. The application, we can debate how it's being applied. And, you know, that's where we are. But I'm going to lean into it. And I'm going to actually offer another aspect of what it means to truly live well, which is perspective. It's how you see yourself, the world around you, the greater, bigger picture. Like that is how you, like for me, staying grounded, you meant that's how I do It's perspective. I've had a lot of adversity in my life. Guess what? So do other human beings. It's part of being human. I've had immense joys. I've had deep sorrows. I've had the full spectrum of the human experience. And every day I get to choose how I wake up and see the world how I wake up and see myself, the people I serve, the world around me, my perspective shifts my reality. And so if I see the world as this complex and challenging, but yet it's so beautiful and awe-inspiring place and the people in it, they're just rad. I mean, like, that's how I think. And that changes your entire life. So I will tell you, as we talked about before, the way you think will change the way you feel and the way you act and it will transform. That to me is the heart of really living well and thriving. It's how you see yourself and the world and you can always control it. Remember that part I said people want autonomy, they want control. You can't control. I say it in my TED talk, all the things like the weather, the road conditions, but you can control how you meet those and what your perspective is. You can go, this is a cool adventure. Wow, I didn't plan on this today. Got to put on my raincoat. Or you can say, this is a terrible day. Wow, how miserable. Your perspective is everything. So that, I think, is another kind of core tenant foundational piece for me of what keeps me really grounded. And then, to be honest, it's living into being fully who I am. This I share personally and professionally. And I share this with people. Think about the way you show up in the world. When you meet Jessica is just a human being roaming the streets of Ocean Beach is where I live in sunny San Diego right now. When you're in a classroom with me, if I'm up on a stage speaking, I am the same exact person. I have the same values. And the cool part, Colin, what enables me to thrive is my values are front and center. They are demonstrated in my actions, not just in my words. And when I stay true to myself and those values, man, am I on fire. And that's what I encourage my patients and my clients to do, to always be yourself, your beautiful, complex, great self, only one of you, and always lead with your values. Surround yourself with people who love and accept you for exactly who you are and stay true to what you believe because you'll go great places. I love it. I love it. Dr. Jessica, it's been such a privilege and honor. We're not done yet, but we're definitely going to be shifting towards uh, the demo. Can you share a little bit about what you're about to uh, demonstrate for us? Absolutely. And I'm excited. I love that we get to have chat. And like you said, we could chat for hours, but also fun takeaways. And an aspect, as I shared, you heard a little theme. Um, You know, I address all areas of health and well-being, body, mind, spirit, all that's important. But I mentioned the historical kind of, you know, my roots, if you will, professionally, really being focused on exercise. And the movement, the the power and joy of movement and its ability to be truly medicine. And so one of the things along my journey is you touched on it when you graciously and very kindly introduced me. I did have the opportunity to write a book. It was published in late 2016 titled Stretching to Stay Young. And of course, you know, just casually have this. (laughs) 
like it's just always right here. So it's just nice and teed up. But what I just, you know, it's funny. I mentioned that kind of being flexible and actually the dedication is to my mom and to my husband of saying thank you. Thank you for helping me in my life, supporting me, loving me, and keeping me flexible in my approach to life. So Mm -hmm. a little kind of Mm -hmm. pun intended there. But one of the things I found with regards to movement is there's so much to find in movement. Joy, immense health benefits. That's physically, mentally, uh, cognitively. I mean, there's like really a lot there. And the evidence continues to grow. Well, interestingly, I will share, I always disclose, what's fascinating as we gather more evidence about really the power of physical activity, right? Because physical activity expands all these structured exercise, you know, just, you know, continuous movement. All of these things have the ability to transform health and well-being. And that to me has always excited me. 20 plus years later, it still excites me just like it did back when I started. But the part that's interesting is where the research is, there hasn't been as much around an aspect that's actually for quite a long time has been a part of the physical activity guidelines, which is flexibility training. And I use that terminology because stretching, we often think about, we're going to do a little stretching. That's where we're going. But flexibility really, you know, the definition is to, to address essentially range of motions of our various joints. And what I always like to think, and one of my great colleagues always talks about this, with like exercise or movement, it's the freedom and ability to do what you love. And shout out to my colleague, Pete McCall, because he always talks about that's what it's all about is to have the ability, the freedom to do what you love. That's why we move and we move with joy because wow, we can move with joy. So the opportunity to create this book and to share it as a resource to tap into that flexibility piece. And so what I'd like to do if we can together, Colin, Mm. just share with everyone who's joining us and tuning in and, you know, just interested in more ways to find joy in movement in being in your physical body. That's what I'd like to offer. If we could go through just a couple of stretches and what, you know, because of our setup today, we'll just do things seated. I always encourage, and in the book, I have tons of ideas. I draw from yoga. There are some kind of yoga inspired movements because I think yoga, I'm biased. I'm a yoga teacher for a long time, but there's so much richness in you know, really you know, ancient teachings. And I know your background, of course, we can look to other systems like Chinese medicine, et cetera. And there's a lot of things that we had a great wisdom about for a really long time. So let's keep mm-hmm. it going. But yeah. stretching is just an opportunity. And the stretching I talk about in the book and that we're going to do together now, it's a reminder that it's not just static stretching like people think of in maybe back in the day, physical education class, right? PE class. Static stretching is one way, that's one type of stretching, but dynamic stretching, ways that we're, you know, preparing for maybe, you know, a more structured workout, forms of exercise, uh, how we're transitioning after we've been engaged in formal activity, kind of that cool down, what can some of those sort of practices look like? We can get into things like, you know, myofascial, self-myofascial release, things like foam rolling people are sometimes familiar with. So I talk about all that in the book because there are different mechanisms by which to address this broad topic of flexibility has many Mm. layers. So again, just thinking about different ways we can move one of the ways, and this is something again, kind of borrowed from yoga, though it's not the only place it occurs, but is this sometimes referred to in yoga as cat and cow pose. And again, it can be done on all fours, you know, on the ground in this case, because we're just, you know, seated and having a conversation. You could do this seated anywhere. You could be on an airplane in your office and you won't be, you know, you won't be too crazy doing it. But all you'll do is you'll actually take your palms and you'll place them on top of your thighs, just right above the knees. And this actually is more of a dynamic stretch or really more of a motion exercise. And so what I like to use is I use the breath and I'll tell why in a little bit. But using the breath, we can inhale and just guide your chest forward, gently arch the back. You can tilt your chin, look up with your eyes as you breathe in. And then breathe out through your nose and just start to round the back. You can draw chin towards your chest and just let the movement really initiate from the upper back. So inhale again, start to arch the spine, let the chest come forward, look up, chin up. And on the exhale, just start to round, kind of coil, pull in and lean back. And you might even feel if you're in a chair, the back of your chair. And you can do this a few times. I can keep talking and you can keep moving, Colin, because teaching group fitness for a while, I can do both. And as you exhale again, that kind of reverse motion. Now, this again is 
it's not a stretch in terms of holding an end range. So keep breathing in as you move forward, that arch spine. Keep breathing out as you move back. But it's rather intended to be a motion exercise. And the reason being is it's actually intended to increase mobility, range of motion in the thoracic spine, the upper back. And after you complete your last time moving back, you can just take a nice seat, sit upright. But that's a seated version of cat and cow pose. Again, you could do it on all fours, same motion. But if you're you know, space limited, like I am today, in a chair works great. But oftentimes we don't think when we think about flexibility that it's not only static stretching, which we're going to do some of that too. But things like that are dynamic stretches or range of motion kind of movements. They can be really beneficial. So that's something I like to share because they make for great kind of warm up, sort of prep for whatever activity you're going to do. That's a great place. Uh, they also make for just great movement breaks during the day, too. If you've been, you know, more sedentary position, it's nice to, again, I'm staying seated, but you could get up, you can get on the ground. There's also great benefit, I will share, from a functional standpoint, of getting down on the ground, getting up from the ground. So, again, other benefits of, you know, changing your orientation. But that's a little cat and cow, and I share it in the book. Now, another one I would like to do that actually is a little range of motion. Again, it'll sound so simple, but Colin, guess what? The best things in life, they actually, they sound simple, but yet they don't always get applied. But if we did it, wow, what a change. We're going to actually go down, meaning down to our feet and ankles. So again, you can't see it, but I'll describe it. What I'll invite you to do is take your hands and take your right leg and just lightly hold the back of your right thigh just above the knee. So now your foot's lifted just you know, a couple inches off the ground. And just start to make some circles in a clockwise direction. And that might be a little brain trap. Which way is clockwise? Just move it in one direction. And then I've already went the wrong direction. <laughs> the goodness called, no one knows. We can't see. But cool thing, we're just going to reverse it. Flip it the other way. And just these ankle circles. Again, the ankle is a very mobile joint. It moves in many directions. And one of the things we start to see when individuals experience dysfunction, pain, you know, I'm telling someone who knows all about this in certain areas of the body, it's not always originating from that area. So the ankles can really be, if we have knee pain, for example, or pain in the hip, sometimes it might be limited range of motion in a different joint. And you can also do things like this. I invite you, Colin, and everyone who's tuning in and following along, you can just do things like Point your toe down towards the ground, plantar flexion in the ankle if you want to get fancy. And you can also draw your toes back like you're pulling them towards your shin, a little dorsiflexion in the ankle. You can move your foot side to side. You can do anything you want with it. I love saying that in my classes because now you're just moving. And you should feel the sensations and just be breathing and feeling. And then I'll invite you to release and switch and do the other side. And as we're doing that, so you know the ways, the cool thing I share with even my yoga classes, because I call them mindful movement. And the neat news, all movement can and should be mindful. It's not just yoga and Tai Chi and Qigong. I mean, they're great. But all movement can be mindful. When you bring attention, feel the sensations. Does one side feel different than the other? Just take note. No need to dwell, but just notice. And just what does it feel like? Where am I feeling it? Again, these range of motion movements these are powerful. This is what enables our body to start to maybe regain some of the mobility in areas that we may not have as much as that joint is actually intended to have. And when you're done, you can just release the left leg and just let it take a break. So I share things like that in the book and someone goes, gosh, that sounds so simple. But when we attend to these things and we attend to it with the right intention and understand why we're doing it, you may find new things if you're open and receptive. Now, I will share because when people think of stretching and often what was described for a very long time in the physical activity guidelines is static stretching. So by definition, static stretching is, you know, holding a stretch to an end range or an end point and just kind of being there. And so I'm going to use one. And this may just for a moment, if you lose sight of my hand, it'll be OK. You'll know it's still there. But I'm actually going to I'll invite you to use your right hand. And so to mirror you, great group fitness instructor, I'll use my left. And all we're going to do is just on a big inhale through the nose, just reach up. Just let the arm come right alongside the ears. First, just start there and go, wow, what does that feel like? Maybe you've been typing all day. You've been working. Be there. Take a big breath in. And on the exhale, reach up and start to reach over. And so we're creating a little bit of a side body stretch here. So you should feel some sensation on the right side of the body. 
when we start to, again, we find kind of that end range. So what does that feel like? It's interesting. In static stretching, we were always told it should feel kind of uncomfortable. But there's some new thinking about, you know, what is that doing or what's the nervous system communicating to us and it feels uncomfortable. So you can play with what's that point where you feel sensation, but it's not feeling like, gosh, if I stay any longer, it's too much. Static stretching guidelines say to hold each stretch for at least 15 seconds, ideally working up to 60 that can be broken up. And what I say is focus on your breath. If you take five deep inhales and exhales through the nose, you don't have to watch the clock because average human breathes 12 to 20 times per minute. And so you can start to come back up, right? And then just relax the arm down. And what we do on one side, we must do on the other. And so on a big inhale, start to reach that opposite left arm up. And just pause there for a moment. Even this is powerful. Someone would say, what's the benefit of this? A lot. We're moving our body in the various ways our body, in this case, particularly focusing on the shoulder at the moment, the shoulder joint can move, just one of them anyways. Big inhale, reach up a little higher like you're trying to touch the ceiling. And then on an exhale, stretch up and over. And so as you stretch now, we're feeling that sensation a bit on the left side of the body. And you can look wherever it's comfortable. Sometimes it's straightforward. Some people like to look down or look up towards that arm. It's whatever's comfortable. And finding that place of sensation, if that's your intention to create sensation. If you focus on taking five deep rhythmic breaths in and out through the nose, one, we actually invite a little bit of the relaxation response, even though right now the nervous system, if you're feeling like, wow, Jessica, this is, this is intense, the nervous system is talking to you. And so that's why we have different ways in which to work on flexibility. As you take that final breath in and then out through the nose, start to come back upright and then just relax the arm down. If you like to shake it out, sometimes it just it feels good. It's just like I say, there's no, you can't do this wrong. You just move and who cares what it looks like. But those are just some of, again, that in yoga, we often call that, we do it standing. So you could, again, change your orientation, do that standing, standing crescent moon pose, it's often called. But just another way, again, that's a static stretch. And that tip I offered about breathing, using your breath as sort of your count instead of, was that 15 seconds, was it 30 seconds? Use your breath because also that creates more mindful awareness. And just notice what you're feeling in your body, the sensations as they arise. Now, if we may, Colin, can we go a little bit further? Uh, if we do have the time, I, again, I'm borrowing a lot from yoga in, in many of this. But one thing that often I find and I talk about in the book is the reality that our body moves in different directions. And so one of the things many of us don't get, though it's very much something we do, if you hopefully every time you get in a car, you buckle your seatbelt, right? You have a small child, you reach over, you pick them up. You are doing rotational movements. And so it's wonderful to think how can we integrate that into the movements we do in our structured exercise or just in these stretch type breaks we're taking, again, in the spirit of increasing flexibility, range of motion. And so what I'll invite you to do is to take your right hand and place it on your opposite left thigh. Then use your opposite, your left hand, and place it back behind you. If you're using a chair like I am, you can just place it anywhere kind of back behind you. And on a big inhale, sit up a little bit taller. Let your spine lengthen. Let the crown of the head draw up towards the sky. And on an exhale, just begin to twist, but lead with your chest. So think a string is connected to the center of your chest, and let it start to rotate you in one direction. Now, I'm just turning to face the camera only because so you can hear me. But this rotational movement, again, you choose the end range. It should not be uncomfortable. This is not a you know, no pain, no gain situation. But it's a place to just explore the fact that the spine rotates, that we can move in various directions. Again, you could use the breath. We could take five deep, rich breaths here. Each inhale, sitting up just a little taller, a little more length in the spine. And each exhale, just either being right where we are, or maybe the exhale takes you just a quarter of an inch further as you rotate. Again, these are choices you'll make based on your intention of why it is you're engaging in this particular movement. And then when you do feel ready, you can start to unwind, come back to center, face forward. I see your smiling face, Colin. And then, of course, what we do one side, let's do the other. So in this case, now we will take the left hand, cross it over to the right thigh. Take the opposite hand and just place it, if you're in a chair like I am, towards the back of the chair. Big breath in through the nose. Sit up a little bit taller. 
and an exhale through the nose. Just allow the body to start to rotate. Think movement from the chest. This is, again, an opportunity to explore. And that's a word I like to use. Explore the range of motion of the thoracic spine. Because that area of the spine is designed to be mobile. And sometimes when people experience, again, sharing things that Colin knows intimately, given your background, sometimes when people experience dysfunction or pain in certain areas, it may be because of a lack of mobility in areas potentially right above or below it or in some other part of the body too. So these are just, again, borrowing a little bit from yoga. You can take those rich breaths. And after you take one more full inhale and one more full exhale, you can just start to, again, unravel, unwind, and nice and easy, just come back to center. And I hope that in just sharing a few of these, you know, it's, again, they seem so simple, yet what's so interesting is so many people say, when I do them, and I do them actually consistently, I notice a difference. Not only how I feel in my physical body, but how I feel mentally, right? How I might just feel, you know, if I'm having a day that feels particularly stressful, that's why I love the integration of breath, because breath alone, as you know, is so powerful. But in this case, it actually can be a tool for us, a facilitator of helping us gauge time when we're doing things like static stretching. And also it can be a great way to facilitate, even though the body is, you know, the nervous system is engaged because it's saying, wow, I'm feeling things maybe I haven't felt in a while. But it also helps to create that sense of a bit of calm and ease. And so I hope that that was helpful, Colin, just to share again, my book, has tons of ideas, uh, also individual stretches, and then pairing some together around activities or different, you know, activities of daily living, just, you know, ways in which to integrate more movement. That was really the spirit in what I shared just now. And what I shared in the book is just ways to move your body in curious, exciting ways your body is actually designed to move. I think, you know, when we're, when I'm engaging all this, it's nice to be reminded that, I don't just have to sit and just stay here and that I can still move within, you know, the position that I'm in, right? So a lot of times, especially more during the pandemic, we are just relegated to just sitting or standing, being sequestered, just being really just more inward, right? And so out of, you know, coming out, you know, it's nice to know that even though there's still things still in place, you know, a lot of people are still working remotely. Some of us are still going back to the office. We still have chances to be able to move, right? And then, and what I love about what you said is that it's really about being creative towards your own unique situation. So it's nice to know that even if we're sitting, I don't necessarily need to think or carve out time mentally or space, you know, mentally that, oh, you know, I got to go to the gym in order to move my body. I could still do this while in place. So yeah. I appreciate the reminder. It's so great. And I just to like really drive that home. That's why I often say things like movement. And that's not to discredit or discount. Structured exercise has immense benefits. We have rich literature to that. And just creating more opportunities. So it's not a one or the other. The ways in which to move more, like you said, in whatever context we're in, we can always find creative ways. I mean, one of the examples in my book is if you're traveling on a plane, I mean, you're, you're in a seat probably about this big and it's like, what can you do? You can do something. And that's really yeah. empowering for people. And it feels good. It feel it just refreshes the mind. It you know, just feels good in the body. It enables you to work again on range of motion of those various joints that sometimes we find because of repetitive movement or maybe lack of activity over time, many reasons that may just not be expressing in their full capabilities, their full range they're intended to. So that's really the spirit and why I approach the book with static stretches, dynamic stretches, self myofascial release, which isn't a stretch per se, mm -hmm. but to share that there's so many creative, to use your word, creative ways to engage our bodies. And my thing is to find joy while doing it because then you'll do it again if you this is part of it too if you enjoy it guess what's going to happen you'll be more yeah, inclined to do it for again. sure for sure and that makes it sustainable that's what i tell my patients too it's if you don't enjoy it, it's not going to be sustainable and you know it's not going to work right and the goals that you want are not going to be achieved because we just haven't found a creative outlet so dr jessica thank you so so much i really really appreciate it what are some things that you like to share promote highlight you know i think you have a conference 
you know, coming up, right? It's coming up or already passed. It's coming up, it's, right? It's coming up. You are so right. And thank you for the invitation to share. I do. So my husband and I are co-hosting a conference. It's the first ever health and well-being coaching conference. So we talked all about what is coaching and, you know, what's all that about. And it's not just for coaches. It's for anyone who's interested in learning more about really what we talked about around behavioral change, that coach approach, deepening coaching skill sets. And so the Health and Wellbeing Coaching Conference, that's the web name of the event, and that's the website where you can find out more. But we have amazing speakers. We're covering everything from behavior change, which is the foundation of lifestyle medicine, foundation for well-being. We are covering so many diverse topics with great speakers. That's happening June 17th and 18th here in sunny San Diego. So I always joke, never a hard sell to say, Come hang out in San Diego and talk with really cool people about really great things. Uh, but that's something I would love to share with the audience. And anyone who does hear this and wants to join, please do reach out to me. I'm at Dr. Jess Matthews on all social platforms. You can also email me, Dr. Jess Matthews at gmail.com. I would love to offer your viewers, your listeners, a special discount if they'd like to join us. That's just an invitation. Should that speak to someone? But check it out. And we're really proud to, you know, be able to be a space to bring people together around the very things we talked about because they are transformative. And if you lead from wanting to serve others, then you're going to fit in really well at our event. I love it. I love it. And we'll definitely share that in the show notes. You know, we'll get the discount, you know, linkage, verbiage, code, whatever. Um, Dr. Jessica, thank you so, so much. You're a light. I wish you continued success and prosperity for all the endeavors that you continue to go on. And even the alphabets, like I'm running out of letters. <laughs> for There's you to still put some behind. more out there. I don't know. Like I'll, I'll find some more. But it's like it's, a, it's like a, it's like a, it's like a, you know, it's like an alphabet cape. You know, it's like, you know, it's like you're, you're, you're moving this way. And then your cape is this string of letters, it's, you know, that's like, flowing. That cape. you said superhero before. And I was like, I I'm did, feeling like, I am I a superhero? Like you, you've given me like, yeah, maybe I am. Oh, yeah. And I've got oh, now yeah. increased self-efficacy. I can do all <laughs> kinds of things. And I empower and encourage your listeners, your viewers, because I know you have a great audience of people who are this fired up about life, living fully, thriving. And so that's what I want. And it's been such a genuine pleasure, a blessing to be here. I, I love this. I love talking with you. I love everything that you do. And I'm delighted to be able to share what fires me up in the hopes that it fires other people up. Well, thank you again. I know this is not the last time we'll keep in touch, but thank you again for you know spending the time and energy with us today. Guys, thank you so much for um, watching another episode. If you like this, please like, comment, share, and subscribe. And if you feel like this is a benefit for someone else, please let them know. Until then, please say goodbye to Dr. Jessica. <laughs> Hey guys, we hope you enjoy that episode. If you like that, please like, comment, and subscribe. And uh, please follow us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify Podcasts, and anywhere that you listen to your podcasts. And if you felt that this was a benefit for someone else, please let them know. And also remember that the first five seasons, 150 episodes, now can be seen and heard on our new The Chef Doc app. And don't forget to give us a five-star rating and we greatly appreciate it. So, and we'll see you on the next one.